peers, those of whom which they may not be able to disagree with politically speaking. And this, how, do, how can they establish a dialogue and conversation, like being able to talk about anything like politics, COVID, or any events without feeling like they feel like they're going to have to force it upon them? Yeah, Does that makes sense. Yeah, for family members especially, or yeah. Um, especially, yes. Yeah. So look, I, this is this is a tough thing, right? Let's let's first talk, talk with your parents about your parents. I'm a big believer in the biblical commandment of honoring your mother and father. 99.9% .9 of the people in this room have no excuse not to honor your parents. I don't care if they don't share your politics. I don't care if they were nasty to you. If they were legitimately abusive in a very serious way, then yes. Okay? But 99% of the time people say, well, I just don't get along with them. I don't like them. If you cannot honor your parents here on earth, then you will not be able to honor the eternal and divine father of which is much more important, by the way. It is, it is a step and an intermediary to that. Secondly, um, with honoring your parents, it is the only one of the Ten Commandments that involves your nation and a promise. Honor your mother and father so that you may live long in the land of which you are in. One of the reasons why America is falling apart is because we have decided to break this commandment and we are teaching children to no longer honor their parents. A nation that no longer honors their parents, you have a bunch of 17-year-olds that think their parents are dumb and stupid and they do what they think is right in their own eyes and that creates a morally chaotic, miserable country very quickly. So I just talked about that on the parents. Do everything you possibly can to not allow divisive politics or different ideas to get in the way of your family relationships or your close relationships. You need to do that. Now, how many people here have family or close friends on the left that won't talk to you because your politics raise your hand? A lot of hands go up. That's unfortunate, that's tragic. Never do that with a leftist. You as a conservative have a moral obligation to even keep a relationship neutral or warm in one way despite the difference in worldview. A worldview is not an excuse to sever a relationship. They might do that to you. You should never do that to them. That is cruel, it is wrong, and it only further divides America. Okay? If they do that to you, ask them to reconsider and try to find common values. I, I know it happens very often. I do not like when people say, well, I'm a conservative father and I refuse to talk to my daughter because she's a liberal. You have a moral obligation to stay in touch with your child, to be truthful to your child. Don't change your views. Be very honest about how you think they have erred in their step, but the left or the people that wish to divide the country would love nothing more than to create silence between family members that have shared experience and bonds just because they have different worldviews. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Hey, Charlie, as the vice president of the Turning Point chapter at Sacramento State University, the rival to UC Davis, I'd like to just thank you real quick for creating an organization that has enriched my college experience greatly. Praise thank God. you. Thank you. All right, now to the questions. So, a quick anecdote, I'll make it very brief, but I am a seven-year veteran of academic speech and debate in high school and college. Um, I have competed at a high level. In fact, last year I was top 32 in the country at my chosen wow. event. But it is so entrenched by the left. In fact, I have an acquaintance named Michael Moreno who at a tournament at Arizona State University was tossed from a round for quoting a piece of evidence from Dr. Jordan Peterson. Yeah. So my question to you is, how do we start to take academia back? What is the yeah. best route to achieve that? Well, that's a great question. Thank you for the enthusiasm and the fact that Turning Point USA has positively impacted your life makes the last decade of work worth it. So thank you, that really, that touches me. And for those of you that support Turning Point USA, you're changing lives every single day. Secondly, um, to take academia back, look, it's, I'm not convinced it's possible in certain areas. I think we have to build new colleges and new institutions. Jordan is doing that with the University of Austin and many other places. Um, but you have to do what we're doing here tonight. You have to try to show up, start Turning Point USA groups. In California, it's hard because the Board of Regents is just, you know, completely and totally lost and out of control. And that's, that's just too bad and it's a shame. But look, the problem with academia is conservatives don't want to go into it for good reason and liberals just continue to, or left-wingers continue to protect their own. My, my big fear is that this woke ideology is now infiltrating the social sciences. It's also infiltrating engineering and mathematics. The things that you thought would be immune to the kind of racial preference, you know, worldview is now totally and completely infiltrated. And so I wrote a whole book called The College Scam, so I'm not exactly big on saving higher education. 
but I do think there is a place for higher education. And it pains me because I go and I visit to Hillsdale College quite often. Hillsdale College is America's greatest college, by the way. They do a fabulous job. And it pains me because I see how good education could be. I, I sit down in these classes at Hillsdale College and they're studying Aristotle's ethics. They're studying you know, Augustine. They're studying the Summa Theologica by Aquinas. Now, I would just venture a guess that many of you have probably not spent more than maybe a week or a month or a semester thinking about Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle and what they had to offer. If you guys are, then I'll stand corrected on that. Or talking about why Western civilization is the greatest and most excellent experiment in self-government in human history. Why is that the case, right? And so education can be great. The pro and there is a place for students to learn classically and read the great books and to have dialogue and discussion. That's not what's happening on university campuses. Instead, you get a steady diet of Robin DiAngelo and Ibram X. Kendi and of Gene Stefanik and of Intro to Critical Race Theory and Herbert Marcuse and Michel Foucault and Jacques Derrida and postmodernism and poststructuralism that really these ideas could be entertained for a short while. It's a really bad idea to build a worldview around them. In fact, it's a great way to burn everything around you if you actually do that. So how do we reclaim it? I think it's time to support the good institutions and build new ones and then get out of the ones that are captured by the ideologues. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, hello, Charlie Kirk. Um, I, I've watched, a, I've been a long time viewer. Um, uh, I don't always agree with you, um, but certainly on this particular issue. Um, so I'm a proponent of universal health care, uh, basically Medicare for all. I, I imagine, I mean, I, I know you're not. You believe in the value of the for-profit health care system. So I guess my question is, like your argument is that the for-profit healthcare system, um, uh, I guess, serves as a, you know for innovation. But I want to know like what innovation does the health does sure. the health private for-profit health insurance provide to yeah, medical? Um, so medical I just want to make sure I understand your position. Are you arguing for a single payer or for the government ownership and running of the healthcare industry? Uh, single payer, I guess, Medicare for all. Got it. Spending it so, to everyone else. Yeah, that, that is that's a gateway to eventually getting to the government-run healthcare system. But your critique is probably not wrong. I have plenty of problems with our current healthcare system, right? Some are driven solely by profit. Some are driven by just bad regulation and honestly not enough profit drive. So I'll give you a great example of a fruit of the free market of the last 10 or 15 years, okay? LASIK. LASIK eye surgery used to be considered a fringe idea that many people considered to be unfounded and not proven. Insurance largely does not cover LASIK. Entrepreneurs got into the industry, and LASIK is now the most performed eye surgery in America with great results and great benefits. The price has gone down and the quality has gone up. Now, that's one example of many, right? And you'd be able to counter. You'd say, well, Charlie, why is it that you, know, you, you go to a hospital and they charge you way too much? and for like a Tylenol, $35 for a Tylenol. Now here's where I can agree with the spirit of the single payer people, which is we need to crush the hospital lobby in this country. It is wrong the way these hospitals operate. They need we need to mandate transparency and pricing. If I have to go to Chipotle to see how many burrito, uh, calories are in a burrito, I wanna see how much everything costs at a hospital the minute I walk into that hospital. Every consumer has a right to know what things cost, right? And so, at times, I'm willing to yield on price transparency. I'm even willing to say that in certain regards that there has been some, some major issues with, ma I, mean, I am no fan, for example, of Pfizer, AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca Moderna, Johnson & Johnson. And so I'm actually more of a moderate on it, where I will hesitate to say, though, the Medicare for All system, what it will do is it will turn the American healthcare system into a major college campus where nobody is actually paying for the good that they're getting. One of the reasons why college is so wildly overpriced and why the quality has decreased is because we have single payer higher education. Many of you take out loans that the federal government is subsidizing and that you're not even directly invested in for a little while, scholarships, grants, and all that. But I think the spirit of what you're saying is smart and I will also be happy partners with you to crush big pharma. I think they have way too much power in this country, and I think they actually make people super sick and not always healthy. Your final thoughts. Um, so I guess a follow-up question is, uh, would you be in favor to, uh, to have uh, the government negotiate drug prices? I think there might be a role for that. I do, and I wouldn't have said that five years ago. The government would probably screw it up, but how could it be any worse than it is now? 
I mean, again, I believe that Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson have done such deceitful and treacherous things, especially in the last couple of years. I am open and willing to use power of the state to start to make sure we're no longer owned by these pharmaceutical companies. Thank you. Yep. Uh, we'll Got to get to the next question. Thank you, though. Hi, Charlie. Um, I want to say, by starting off, I was told by your wonderful assistant over here that I should tell you that I disagree with almost everything. Obviously, we have not had a two-hour conversation. So, like, who knows? Who knows? Maybe we had a few beers. We agree on something, but I'll have, wa now, I'll have water. I've, you can have whatever all you I've, want. All so. I've heard is stuff that I'm just like, what? Um, first, <laughs> I want to say that I guess as the first two hours of your speech was you complaining about kind of these leftists and kind of this, but I've never heard any policy positions. When I go to something like a, a Senator Sanders convention or someone on the left, they're talking about healthcare, inequality, inflation, uh, growth, but you guys all seem to want to talk about is how the left does this or the left does that, but no policies on how to fix anything. So I guess that kind of goes with my first question is, what is the GOP's actual position when it comes to fixing inflation? Well, for, let me, a couple things. First of all, okay. I'm not a senator, nor am I aspiring to be one. Number two, Yes, I was mildly distracted by the windows being broken and the terrorists outside. I fully acknowledge that, okay? So I was a little policy shallow tonight and a little bit terrorist deep, okay? I'll fully, I, I, will, I will admit that. Um, third, I'll say this. I don't speak for the GOP, right? I have my own ideas, and I actually think the GOP does a terrible job. But let me give you some ideas that I think you might agree with, okay? I think that vital products should be made in America, not in China. And we should use tariffs and sanctions to get it done. Vitamin C, penicillin, critical infrastructure should be manufactured here. I think American college graduates should be given preference to go work for American companies above foreign workers. And that means reforming the H-1B system and actually giving you, the American college educated kids, a preference because we have a moral obligation to our own citizens over the citizens of another country. I think we should fully close the United States southern border. I think we should not allow illegal... I, I just want to interrupt you. Sorry. You were saying you're for a government program that puts American college students. So like, no, no, reforming the immigration system, right? So that big companies like Facebook don't do quasi indentured servitude to bring foreign workers in and be able to compete but government against. Would, gov that would be a government program that would do that. Well, yeah, the government program actually already exists. Okay, so you're yeah. actually a conservative who's for increasing the government size, not for Well, no, I want a small but strong government. So I want things that are smart. For example, I'd love to have more border patrol agents and less IRS agents. So where it makes sense to increase the volume of government agents, as long as it is pursuing a couple things that are core to my philosophy, a strong country that has borders, sovereignty, culture, and maintains a moral commitment to its citizens that you should be able to work hard, play by the rules, be able to have a family, own a home, and see rising income and wages. Those are very basic things in a social contract. Why is the increasing IRS agents, which are taxes that belong to us, they help pay for things like roads, GPS, infrastructure, basic right. things they, that they, you they and yourself needed to get here. Yeah, why so. would that be against? Why would that be so bad? Having everyone pay their fair share of taxes, so we can have a government that functions correctly. Well, Obviously, government does work for everything, but we all benefit from government services every day. And the I, I'm sorry, no one in this room is going to benefit from 87,000 new IRS agents. Instead, those 87,000 new IRS agents are going to be deployed against small business owners. But I could keep on going with policy examples. I can keep on building it out. But let me just say this: I love markets but I'm willing to critique markets when I think they're not serving people and they're not serving the nation. I think our overindulgence in free trade fanaticism has been a major mistake over the last 20 or 30 years. I don't worship corporations, but I do think that entrepreneurs and private property rights and people taking risks are a general good for society. And not only does history show this, but common sense logic and you know, material reality shows all this. I can give you more and more examples if you want of policy stuff. That's less actually interesting. The reason I don't go through policy stuff is, again, whoa, is that I'm not running for office, right? I don't represent the Republican Party. But if I can build out a worldview that you can agree with, then the policy answers will come naturally, right? So if you understand morals and values, then you can answer the next 1,000 policy questions. I guess for me as a student, questions. I care a lot more about policy than what people say. Like, like what government does is a lot more important to me, and that's why I was confused why your speech was not about policy. Because, again, I'm but not anyway, running for office. I want to ask one more question so, before I go. Um, I guess for us, there used to be a thing called the middle class, or the idea of a growing and strong middle class. Yep. And I feel like for the past 10 years, especially on the right, maybe on the left too, for the more neoliberal left, but the right, that idea is kind of shrunken. I don't think there's a lot of talk in middle class. Do you view income inequality as a problem? I totally and disagree. Income inequality, I want to so, say income inequality being the difference between the Let me the ask you, though. I, I have a question. Why is it that the wealthiest counties in America all vote on the left? Because that's where all the... 
how money works and how capitalism works is how all, where all the wealth is where all the people want to be. But like, so Silicon Valley is all the jobs what, what, and all that Why stuff. do they vote liberal then if the left... Well, what, in what ways do they vote liberal? Not on taxes, not on for, things that I am for. They vote for socially, Joe Biden, they vote for Nancy left, Pelosi. They're, they're socially so, left, but they're not economically left. Believe me, I've, if you go to the Bay Area, they are very economically right. Dianne Feinstein is not left, in my opinion. So it's, it may be left socially, but I don't think they're left in my point of view. Yeah, but so, so then let me ask you then, why is it that the muscular class in America has shifted right over the last seven years? Not according to the midterms. I mean, you guys, you guys tanked on the midterms okay, most recently. You keep so on like, saying you guys. I don't represent sorry, the Republican my, Party. My apologies. But the, I, just, I, the, I just want to critique one of your misguided premises, which is that somehow the right is not representing middle class voters. It's the opposite. Actually, states that were tradi are traditionally blue collar, muscular class, middle class states are now solid red states. Look at Ohio. Ohio is a state that used to be far left and now it's more in the right direction. So what is the right actually doing about it? To answer your question, a couple things. We're rejecting neoliberalism. Like, how about this? We shouldn't send $200 billion to Ukraine and we should instead represent our own people and close our own border. That's number one. Number two, number two is that we should be unafraid to use tariffs and sanctions to say that critical infrastructure and things that matter should be made here in America. Whether the, the delusion on the left, and I just want to challenge you on mm -hmm. this, is that the left has a bunch of people that talk a good game, AOC and Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden, but when it really matters, they're nothing more than neoliberal shills that are willing to invade other countries, invite them into our country, and then lie to their voters under the veneer of social liberalism. The populist movement in America that represents real people, muscular class teachers, police officers, and firefighters, it lives on the American right because we listen to our constituents and we're willing to fight for ideas like tariffs, sanctions, closed border, and no more money to Ukraine, the left is shilling for all those things. Okay. Thank you for being here tonight. I appreciate it. Got to the next, getting to the next one. Thank you. Can I just ask, is, is, is the difference between the mean and the median? Income uh, inequality, there, is that a problem There's 50 people in line. Thank you. Is that uh, a income inequality is a big issue, yeah, which is exactly why I support the things that I said. Next question. Okay, my, my question is short. Should America be a more isolationist nation to aid in the interests of the American people? Depends on the situation. Give me an example. Um, wars in the Middle East, wars with Iran, wars in Ukraine, wars in Yemen. Uh, I, 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 would, limit, I would limit funding all across the board on those, yeah. What was that? I, I think that our role should be limited in all those, especially with Ukraine. We shouldn't give a dime to what's happening in Ukraine, uh -huh. especially as our own border remains wide open. What was that? What was that, Charlie? I didn't hear. Especially as our own border remains completely and totally wide open and 5,000 people are entering illegally every day. I find it silly that D.C. gets really mad that Ukraine's border gets invaded and our border gets invaded every day. But sorry, do you have a follow-up thought? Nope. That was it. Thank, Thank you. you. And by the way, if you disagree, you're welcome to come to the front of the line. The staff will help you. Let it be known the evil fascist Charlie Kirk wants people who hate him to come to the front of the line. Next. Hi, Charlie. My name is Cole. Um, I think I agree with you. I just wanted to ask, uh, with how much our school systems have changed since even when I was a kid, uh, I'm only 20, what is the best way to shield our younger children from falling into yeah. the uh, mindset that they're trying to teach the very... Uh, I, I get the question a lot. Okay. Thank you. If you're able to homeschool, I'm a big fan of homeschooling. I am, and I know that's very difficult. And then I think you have to find good private schools, if not that. And if you have to send them to government schools, you have to fight for better schools and better school boards and stay involved in those school districts at every possible way you can. And so um, there's no easy answer. But you know what the most important time is? It's not the time in the classroom. It's the time that your kids have with you at home. Turn off all the devices on the weekend and talk about the Constitution. Talk about the founding. Talk about the Civil War. Become your child's teacher regardless of where you send them to school. Homeschooling is not just doing it Monday through Friday. Homeschooling is a 24-7, 365 operation where you're constantly educating your children about American values, hopefully you know, Judeo-Christian values as well. So that'd be my advice to you. Thank you, God bless you. you. Uh, hi, I know you're generally in favor of uh, smaller governments. Uh, my question- Can you make sure you go right into the microphone? I'm sorry, I'm having a trouble hearing you, yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, I, I know you're in favor in small government for a lot of issues. Um, I know that uh, drugs are a big issue in America. I was wa wondering what was your perspective on recreational drugs in general, the legalization of drugs, um, and just what your perspective on that was? Sure. The uh, mass legalization of drugs has been a major mistake 
in our country. I used to be for it, and I've had a 180 degree reversal, and I'll tell you why. I believe in a small but strong government with prudent and effective and, let's just say, common sense laws. I used to be one of those guys that was a conservative that said, if we really want to reduce government and make the cartels weaker, let's legalize weed, and that will really make the cartels weaker. And then we'll have less people in prison. Everything I believed was completely incorrect. Let me tell you why. As we've legalized weed, especially in the American Southwest, we've seen more violent crime, not less. The cartels are wealthier and stronger than ever before. One of the arguments was, well, kids now are going to be able to not do harder drugs. That's not true. Kids are now getting into fentanyl and harder drugs earlier because whether or not we want to admit it, marijuana is a gateway drug. That is a true fact. Kids don't just start with fentanyl. They start with marijuana, and it goes to other drugs, and we see that happen time and time again. So actually, I believe that cr the decriminalization of weed has been something that actually makes government bigger. We now need more social workers. We now need more services. We're now giving more people things on welfare, uh, you know, money on welfare. And so while I understand the spirit and potentially the, principal, you know, the principle of you know, de -le you know, legalizing or decriminalizing drugs, we have to look at the evidence. And the evidence is that we live in a sadder society, a more depressed society, a more anxious society, a more violent society, the more that drug use has gone up over the last decade. Uh, can I ask a follow-up question? Uh, I was wondering if, um, in what ways, you, you said that the cartel has become stronger with the legalization of marijuana. Uh, I was just wondering, like, what, what, what are the reasons for that? Yeah, so they're no longer in the business of growing weed in the Sinaola region, so now they traffic fentanyl in people. Okay, much more profitable and much more dangerous and murderous. So we basically told the cartel, stop trafficking the thing that actually wasn't as bad. It's bad, okay? And now they've gotten into really rich business where they get $5,000 a head when they traffic them across the Rio Grande Valley and they're doing 5,000 a day. Or they get fentanyl trafficked in from China that this much of fentanyl, like a salt grain of fentanyl, will kill your grandkid almost instantaneously. And so now the fentanyl, is, I mean, the, the cartels are bigger and stronger than ever before. They're more brazen and bold than ever before. They're kidnapping and killing Americans. They're controlling the entire Mexican government. The border is now completely controlled by the cartel. And we were told that drug legalization would make the cartels irrelevant the same way that the legalization of alcohol made the mob less powerful in the 30s. That was a lie, by the way. The mob just went into a different business, okay? It's not like they stopped committing violent crime, and it's just not true. The cartels are running the entire southwestern part of the border and m many parts of the southwestern United States. Uh, last follow-up question with that. I, I see your point that uh, the legalization of marijuana has increased drug, drug use and has increased the demand for things like fentanyl and heroin yep. and stuff. Uh, I was wondering, I guess, like, why is um, making out things like alcohol illegal but making things like marijuana illegal? Why, why is alcohol more acceptable than sure. marijuana, for example. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I'm ex not exactly a big fan of alcohol. I actually think alcohol is a really bad drug, and we overly glamorize alcohol in our society. I think we'd do some good to actually limit alcohol intake. I think it would actually make people's lives better, and I think we've way over socialized drink drinking in our country. Now, that's a separate argument, though, because that's making something that's currently legal illegal. We're talking about making something that's illegal legal, right? So those are two separate things. But if you were to say wave a magic wand and people would drink less in America, I'd say sign me up for that because I mean if you look at the amount of DUIs violent crime if you look at if you look at domestic assault alcohol is almost always involved almost always so I would say this right now the question is on marijuana and it has been proven right now to have massive externalities that are negative over 70,000 people died of fentanyl overdoses last year right and over 140,000 people die from the effects of alcohol every single year now I'll be the most unpopular public commentator on the planet to argue for a ban or an abolition of alcohol. But let me just say this. Someone needs to have the courage to say the amount we drink in our country is bad for us, and it's making us deeply unhappy. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so as someone who, who claims to be such a bastion of uh, freedom of speech, why do you call the protesters outside terrorists um, outside of, say, one broken window? Well, it's more than one broken window. Assaulting cops, spray painting the death threats that they throw at me, the violent intimidation, the graffiti. But that's not, don't you think it's bigoted to call all protesters who are outside as terrorists when a handful of minority might be representing um, some Wait, uh, why would it be bigoted? Threats? They're mostly white liberals without jobs. Sorry? 
Why is it bigoted? They're mostly white liberals without jobs. But it's call, you're calling all protesters terrorists? I'm calling Antifa out there that are anonymizing their identity, sending death threats to my family, smashing windows, and spray painting the campus the entire week leading up to this terrorist. Yes, I absolutely stand by that. But so, so the, that wouldn't, that wouldn't, the, a lot of them are just college students who don't agree with the point of view that you're propagating. Well, maybe today. they should have come to the front of the line and asked a question like you and not acted like somebody in a third, in a third world country where, we settle our dif where they settle their differences with gang violence. But just to be sure, those people who are there to register their protest aren't terrorists. Okay, the terrorist definition is a person who uses unlawful violence and intimidation, especially against civilians, in the pursuit of political aims. Did they do that? I, I, don't, think, I don't think so. I was, Wait, hold on. I was the, a person who unlawfully violent, window smashing, graffiti, assault Not against police officers. Not okay. all of them. H hold on a second. The leaders... They cover for themselves. And by the way, we only a small of them are isolated and they're all in one big black block. And don't, don't try to, you know, don't try to gaslight the people here or the people watching online. There's hundreds of them. They're working in a coordinated network with coordinated tactics. And these are not just quote unquote college kids. There's obviously somebody behind this with funding and sophistication with quasi paramilitary tactics. And let me ask you a question. Why is it? that when people go into the United States Capitol and take a selfie, they're called terrorists by our government. But when you start to terrorize and smash windows and put violent threats and death threats to me, it's somehow bigoted to call them terrorists. So first of all, it's not, it wasn't a coordinated effort as someone who was there. Um, I didn't, I just knew that there was this event happening and that there would be a protest to, um, in order to register um, our, our point of view. I, I was not part of any coordinated effort, and neither were a lot of the other people who were there. We don't appreciate the label of being terrorists, especially a lot of us well, are from this? countries where you shouldn't appreciate is very the, spread, the, so. the label or the activity. Why don't you come here and say, you know, I'm pretty damn embarrassed that people that agree with me resort to violence instead of going Absolutely. up here and trying to lecture me yeah. about calling them terrorists? Absolutely. But this isn't about. You're making a I fool of yourself. Why I don't you know. go out and talk to your buddies and tell them to stop understand. trying to shut down our event? So I don't know why your response is always a whataboutism. I mean, I'm just asking it's if not. you, if you I'm take asking back questions that not you can't answer ism. What? I've, I've answered each of your questions. I'm just saying no, that let me ask you a not question. everyone is will part you, of let me a ask you a question. Will, will, you, will you publicly condemn the violence done in the political spirit outside by the people that you were protesting alongside? Will you do it that right now? It depends what you're referring to. Smashing I, of windows I, I, and assaulting police officers. I don't think breaking, breaking windows is a good idea. Assaulting but police officers. Do you no condemn that? No one assaulted police officers. You what? I was there. No one assaulted police That's officers. That's lie. That's I was not there. true. Throwing eggs and objects at police officers was... is a legal definition of assault, no matter how much you try to gaslight so it or just, spin it. If I can just, without, without resorting to whataboutism, using your definition of terrorism, if the police uses unjust violence against civilians, should that also count as terrorism? Absolutely not. But first of all, your definition of unjust. I'm just taking your definition of No, no, no. Let me, let me read this again. Unlawful Sorry. violence and intimidation, especially against civilians in the pursuit of political aims. Antifa doesn't just do this here. They did this in Sacramento and assaulted one of our Turning Point USA employees I'm not Antifa. and sent one of them to the hospital. Antifa, oh, by the way, the same buddies, the same tactics, the same coordination, the same wardrobe, the same language, the same signs. You know what they did two weeks ago? They arsoned and firebombed an entire police training headquarters in Georgia in massive coordinated fashion. And so right now what we are seeing is the rise of left-wing domestic violent extremism and the failure to acknowledge or admit it means that you are blinded by ideology. Thank you for being here tonight. We'll get to the next one. But uh, hello, Charlie. Wait. Uh, I just want to say uh, I don't exactly agree with you on everything, but it was a great speech, and I did like hearing your points. And there are some things that we did agree on. For example, Big Pharma, I totally agree with you on that. But my question isn't related to that. So, uh, well, first I want to ask you, what, so what is your stance on guns in terms of, like, gun control? I think yeah. I know, but... Uh, I mean, I'm very pro-Second Amendment. Right, yeah. okay. So, you know, against gun control. Right, making guns legal. Yeah, no. Um, so... So you believe, I'm assuming that like by making guns uh, illegal, uh, criminals are still gonna get their hands on guns, correct? 
Yes, but uh, let, me tell you, let me tell you my position, okay? The Second okay. Amendment is there to protect all the other amendments against a potentially tyrannical government. If we act as if that has not happened in history, we're not even reading our 20th century history. I fully acknowledge and admit when you allow gun ownership, you're going to have gun deaths. There is a cost to liberty. Anybody who, if you, if you argue for Second Amendment rights and say that you're going to get gun deaths to zero, that, that, is, that is a falsehood. That is also why I support driving. I think driving is a moral good, but you're going to have 50,000 people a year that die in auto fatalities. Liberty comes at a price, and so I believe that, yes, there will be costs and consequences of having firearm ownership, but the positives far outweigh the negatives. Please ask your question, though. Yeah, so it's, it's actually kind of to do with, um, it's, so using that same logic, right, if like criminals will get their hands on the guns anyway, there's no point in banning them, then by that same logic, should we not legalize marijuana? Because won't the kids get their hands on it anyway from either like people who are older or criminals, like just using that same logic, would it make sense to then also ban marijuana? Yeah, so two things. So I didn't actually use the criminals will get their hands on it. It happens to be true. But the other part is that the evidence shows the opposite, that kids are doing more weed than ever before. It's now laced with things it was not laced with a couple decades ago. It's stronger than ever before. And we were told that, well, if it's accessible and it's commercialized, kids will be less likely to do weed. The, use, the usership of kids under 12, 50% in a national survey of kids 10 to 13 have tested with some form of cannabis or marijuana. That's a bad thing for the country. It's not good. And that's ha the more we've legalized it, the more we glamorize it, the more we normalize it, the more we have kids doing marijuana. And I, I, here's the other thing. I don't see a moral good for marijuana. I do see a moral good for private citizen firearm ownership. So the, the, the equivalent is not one to one. Well, I understand. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. We'll do a couple more. And if you disagree, tell our staff and come on up. Hi, Charlie. Um, so I just first wanted to comment quickly on the guy who was defending the protesters outside. Um, so I'm the vice president of the UC Davis Turning Point chapter, yeah. and <laughs> and the same people who organize those protests outside have put my name on flyers and my face on flyers That's for my social do. media, put it all over campus, wheat pasted it so it's glued to the wall, and they've called me a homophobic fascist, a bigot, they've said I'm not welcome on this campus, and they've published my phone number and email so that people could be able to harass me. So if um, unlawful intimidation in the pursuit of political aims is the definition of terrorism, I'd say even that probably falls into the definition. That's exactly right. That alone is terrorism, right? Thank you for your courage. What, what's your question? Yeah, so then the other point I had, um, I had a question for you, um, probably an easier one than a few of the other ones, but um, <laughs> so the left, as we can see, has really serious positions for the future. They have really serious opinions and hopes and visions for the future of the US. Yeah. Um, serious enough that they're willing to organize into groups of hundreds and break things and burn things down. And we on the right, that gives us lots of time to talk about it and make fun of it and, you know, make compilations and whatnot. And that's all good and funny and entertaining. And that sort of roped me in at some point. But um, what is our vision for the future? What are we willing yeah. to get that passionate it's about? It's a great Maybe question. So windows. three really basic yeah. things that I think should be a commitment to the next generation. It should be easy and celebrated to get married, have children, and be able to own property in this country. It should be a moral guarantee to the next generation to be able to do those three things. It's good for everybody. It anchors you in responsibility, right? Right now, it is harder than ever to buy a home in America, thanks to inflation and thanks to all this nonsense that's happening. We are telling young people not to get married, and we're saying that if you have children, it could be an existential threat to the climate. And we wonder why this is the most depressed, suicidal, anxious, alcohol-addicted, and medicated generation in history. Those three things should be a core social compact. I could, go, I could go through list by list though, right? I want a country that cares more about our borders than the borders of a foreign country. I want a country that makes stuff that is critical to our national sovereignty and our future, such as vitamin C, penicillin, actually made here in America. And finally, well not finally, but in addition, I'll say this, I wanna see church attendance go up. I wanna see less kids addicted to pornography. I wanna see more people outside. I wanna see people spending less time on their phones. I think we should, we should entertain at least the spirit of a national week day of rest. I call it the Sabbath. You can call it whatever you want. I think we should have a day where we slow down. 
I think that we're able to get Uber Eats quicker than ever before. We're able to get medication we want. We have more ease and convenience that we're more miserable than ever before. Why don't we actually tolerate? We don't have to do laws, even though laws might be a good idea, where we just rest for a day. We used to call these blue laws, where everything kind of slows down. You spend time with loved ones. You don't look at the phone all day long. Maybe your favorite restaurant isn't open that day. Maybe you actually have to cook for yourself. I want that country. I want a country that actually is purposeful in our action, in our community, that is more local than it is corporate, that focuses more on the family than some abstract ideology. That's what I think we as conservatives need to fight for and fight for vigorously while they do all the nonsense that they do. We've got to get to the next one. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for taking time out to come to California, even though you might hate it here. <laughs> um, I guess you could say I took the scenic route to conservatism. Um, second generation college student. I went to an HBCU actually in Washington, D.C., um, doing some work now in the public sector for the government. So I'd like to get your take on how someone that might look like me or come from my socioeconomic background can find a home in conservatism, or if not conservatism, where can someone who might find themselves in the gray area go if they don't fall into one camp or the other? Well, let me tell you, you have a home in the conservative movement if I have anything to say about it. So, and I'll be honest, the other thing, I don't want to live in a country where I care about people's race. It doesn't mean anything to me. I care about that you're a sweet person and that you're trying to do better in your life. I care about your values and your actions. Your melanin content is irrelevant to me, and it should be irrelevant to everybody else. I want to live in that country. And so conservatism, if I have anything to say about it, will be values-based and ideas-based and merit-based, not race-based, not melanin-based. And so, look, you're working for the government in the public sector. You know, I don't know if you're a religious person or not, or you believe in God, but I would, I would just encourage you to pray if your God is using you for your greatest and highest purpose. But I could tell you right now, if God answers your prayer and you say, get in the fight for freedom, we need people right now on the front lines, working for Turning Point USA, working for churches that are engaged and active, like Greg Farrington's church. I think some folks from his church are here. And thank you guys, by the way, fabulous church. Uh, and so there is a place in conservatism for you. And, but it might not look for working for Turning Point USA. It might be, hey, I'm going to you know, work for this local committee or whatever it might be. But if you're passionate about these ideas, we need you. We need you badly. God bless you, and thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Two more questions. Hey, Charlie, 18-year-old uh, activist out of Sacramento, sophomore year college student, and proud member of the ex-recall Gavin Newsom team, by the way. So as you know, there's a Democrat supermajority in our state legislature and a committee in our state legislature, state assembly did something, or state senate did something ridiculous today. Uh, they passed a bill that would put women's menstrual products in men's restrooms in government facilities and not a single Republican on the committee voted against the bill or spoke out against the bill. They decided to abstain so it passed easily. My question is, how do we get our representatives to fight against this crap? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> stop worrying about being offended all the time. I mean, this is one of my big complaints of conservatives in general, which is fight for what is true, and who cares the names they call you. I mean, you're trying to tell me not a single Republican voted against that in committee? I mean, I am telling you that not a single Republican in that committee had a backbone to vote against yeah. that bill, and that is what disappoints me. Yeah, it disillusions they're, me. They're afraid of people like Scott Weiner and all these other people. Exactly. That, yeah, uh, I've I had, was going to say that. I've Scott Weiner talks Twitter disputes with Scott Weiner. Right. And um, yeah, he's uh, he's not he's not well at all. There's well, yeah, I mean, I could tell from his uh, tweet yesterday where he said that. Um, there's a bill now in our state legislature a, a, a proposed by a Republican that would allow a parent to know if their child is transitioning yep. socially uh, within schools. And Scott Weiner came out and said that this is a Ron DeSantis style bill that yeah. is oppressive to the well, LGBTQ community. So, yeah, of course he did. I mean, I, I got in a whole Twitter dispute with Scott Weiner because he said that I'm the one that was inciting hatred against him because I decided to tweet about those perverted bills that he's pushing in the legislature. And he says, I'm a victim. I'm all these things. Like, okay, Scott Weiner, how about you defend the bills? actually of why you creepily think kids should be taught the most graphic personal things without parental consent but he, he won't answer that question look you have to fight and he, I am I love California conservatives I think there's so much fight left in so much of what you guys are doing um, but it's gonna be it's gonna be a long-term project right 
And you got to find the fighters, you got to support the fighters, and you have to support the ones with the backbone. And honestly, the ones that don't, ask them, why, is it, why are you not standing for what is right in the legislature? The bill's going to pass anyway. Why wouldn't you stand for what is right? So God bless you for your activism, thank you. and thank you. Final thank question. You. Hi, Charlie. I'm gladly not an 18-year-old student here at Davis, but I'm, a, I'm an older millennial student who work with and attend the TPUSA meetings here. And I also work with LaRouche Pack, who, God bless them, are, are real true unsung heroes, I would say. Um, so Silicon Valley Bank, which I'm sure you heard, just yep. went kaputs. Now, it's a fact that their board are all about, their agenda is wokeism, yep. right? So. So Christ chased the money changers out of the temple. And now my question is, with Josh Hawley just, just publicly backed up and, and is saying, calling for the reinstatement of Glass-Steagall Bank I, Separation I think it's probably Act. a good idea. And, and my, my question is simply, is what is your position on it? Will you support it? And the fact that we need to absolutely, rather than fund, all, you know, Wall Street, yeah. right? We need so, to fund. We need to fund the, the rebuilding of America. Yeah. So just so everyone knows, Glass Steagall was the repealing, or it was the instituting. I always get confused. It basically allowed commercial banks and investment banks to become one. It, this would make it separate. Look, I think, I think heads need to metaphorically roll. Okay, metaphorically for what happened at Silicon Valley Bank. The regulators, the people involved, it's, it's wrong on multiple, multiple levels. And isn't it interesting how scared people are to actually criticize the banks right now, especially in the media? It's just terrible. And what the heck was the government doing? Where were the regulators that are supposed to do their job that are supposed to be checking in on this? And I'm very afraid of the fragility of the American banking system right now. And um, I hope I'm wrong. I hope that there's the full faith and credit behind it. Reinstituting Glass-Steagall would be the first step of many, in my opinion. But I think we need to repeal Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank has been really unfair to small and local banks, which I think is actually their next focus. They're going to try to get rid of mid and local banks and try to hyper-corporatize J.P. Morgan, Citibank, and Wells Fargo as kind of the big three, like almost like the telecom companies. Really quick, yeah. Great. Yeah, why I brought up LaRouche Peck is because they endorsed Trump, and they're the ones who fought for Glass-Steagall since really 2007. Yeah, I'm not familiar with it, but thank you for bringing yep. that up. So thanks for being here tonight. Thank you. All right. I want to summarize this. A very important announcement. Um, there is a fear that the mob might, again, they're not terrorists. They might actually try to uh, be violent towards you. Okay. Do not engage with them. All right. Stay peaceful. If you feel unsafe, you know, ask a police officer, ask one of our staff. We want all of you to get home safely, but this is what they do, especially on the exiting of events. These people can be really nasty, uh, especially with the experience I've had with them over the last couple of years. So please be peaceful. Don't do anything with them. They're the ones that are, you know, uh, un doing uncalled for things. Um, so please keep that in mind. And um, it's a good thing this event happened tonight, but it's, I just want to remind, I do not want to live in a country where I have to have this much police support and I have to have my send-off message of be safe on an American college campus because you might have a baseball bat thrown at you. We are fighting for the moral goodness and decency of speech. Tonight's speech one, please be vigilant on your way out and stay peaceful. Thank you for supporting Turning Point USA and God bless you.